This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. How is it possible to know what to believe and what not to believe? How can the average person penetrate all the conflicting theories and theologies advanced in the name of religion? Consider a parallel. Historians say the most famous showman of all time was Phineas Taylor Barnum, who named his circus the greatest show on earth. He's reputed to have said there's a sucker born every minute, and oftentimes he deliberately hoaxed the public. For instance, once he displayed what he billed to be a cherry-colored cat, which turned out to be an ordinary black cat. Barnum would then say, but you've seen black cherries before. One interesting aspect of this, however, was that Barnum fooled people so often, they didn't believe him sometimes when he presented something genuine. The best example of that was the real white elephant, an albino, which Barnum bought at great cost and showed all over the country, but nobody would believe that it was real because he had presented so many hoaxes before. That is no doubt how multiplied millions of people feel about religion. They've been victims of hypocrisy and sincerity and outright charlatanism so often in the name of religion that they're likely to turn their backs on the real thing when it appears. Specifically, people have seen the disputing religions about Jesus for so long that many have forgotten the religion of Jesus is something immensely different. It is a faith of joy, power, and newness. What are some of the standards of religious validity? If a teaching is consistent with truth and beauty and goodness, and with the love of God and the love of people, there is high likelihood of its validity. One of life's greatest experiences is that of getting honest with God. Many, even some rather religious people, suppose that they can conceal things from their Creator. But you can't play games with God and win. God knows every hair on your head, every tooth in your mouth, every filling in every tooth, every cell in your body, every freckle on the back of your neck. God is aware of every longing in your heart and corpuscle in your bloodstream, every hangnail on your fingers and thought in your mind. God knows what time you go to bed, how well you sleep, what you dream about, when you get up, how you like your coffee, weak or strong, cream, sugar, neither or both, what you do all day and why. God is quite well aware of how much money you have in your checking account, every bill on your desk, every book on your bookshelf, Every detail of your sex life, social life, business, hobbies, hopes, fears, frustrations, all are completely known to the eternal God, your spiritual father, a God who loves you, and a spark of God's spirit indwells your mind. There is no place anyone can hide. The kingdom of God is within. You might as well be honest with God. You might as well admit what both of you already know. You just as well look at your life the way it really is rather than daydream about the way it might have been because God knows exactly what you are and God knows what you might have been. But God knows one thing more. God knows what you could be as well. If you'll be honest with yourself, you'll recognize what you are and what you might have been, but God sees what you can become in the future. God has a will for your life. And if you give your life to God in faith and dare to live as a son or daughter of his, you can find that will of God and truly begin to live it. God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your life. And this is newness. There's an old German proverb, forgive others everything, yourself nothing, which is half true, the first half. Forgive others, but learn to forgive yourself. If God can have mercy on you, and can care about you. Learn to have mercy on yourself and care about yourself. If you've ever watched a football or baseball game on television, you've seen what they call the instant replay, which is an immediate videotape playback of a crucial segment of the action on the field. Guilt, comparatively, is psychological replay. It is the endless and purposeless mental reviewing of previous sins, mistakes, and failures. Accepting God's love and God's forgiveness for you will not help you forget the memory of your wrongdoing, but it will assist you to stop replaying it continually in your thoughts. Forgiveness frees you to live in the future unshackled by your past. To maintain the memories of past quarrels, insults, and hostilities is about as useful as saving up all your old toenail clippings in a plastic bag. You can if you want to, but it is not the most transcendental of undertakings. With some regularity, one continues to read of small bombs and grenades originally brought home by soldiers as souvenirs from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, suddenly exploding and maiming or killing someone in the household. It is every iota as unenlightened to collect past hatreds and hostilities in the human heart 
as it is to keep live artillery on your coffee table or use a landmine as a doorstop. Pray for strength to forgive, strength to love, strength to be a brother or a sister, even to the unbrotherly, to be a spiritually transformed person. For the kingdom of God is within you. Recently, a man wrote to this radio broadcast saying that he profoundly craved to know God, but he felt that he couldn't. My answer is that the craving, the very craving to know God is the certain sign that in fact you have found God and that God has found you. God is already near to you right now, this instant. I could illustrate this. Suppose you're strolling along the street downtown one day, feeling fine, completely content. When you chance to pass a restaurant, you smell the food and suddenly begin to feel hungry. This has happened to everybody, I would suppose. What was it that made you hungry? The smell of the food. The fact that you were near the food. Feeling hungry under those circumstances is not because the food is far away, but because it is very near, so close you can smell it. It is much the same with God. You crave for God, not because God is far away, but because God is near to you, because your spiritual appetite has been whetted by the quiet inner awareness of the presence of God, his spirit near to you, within you. So what it is really that you crave is not simply finding God, but knowing God better. It's like eating peanuts. Have one or two and it's hard to stop. Know God a little and you want to know God more. Your craving for God means not that you haven't found God, but that you have. And the next step is deepening that relationship, getting to know God, sharing your life with God in a vital sense of daily companionship, living in the joy, the worship, the praise, the love, the exuberance of being the son or the daughter of God in faith you really are. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, the lesson of life is to believe what the years and the centuries say against the hours. This is the spiritual perspective. Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist philosopher, said, you will never find peace and happiness until you are ready to commit yourself to something worth dying for. And the highest purpose of all is the purpose of God, God's will for your life, which is not only worth dying for, but far more importantly. It's worth living for, and there is joy in that. Charles Kingsley wrote, there are two freedoms, the false, where man is free to do what he likes, and the true, where man is free to do as he ought. The spiritual things are the most vital experiences in human life. Dr. Charles Myers, telling about a fire that had destroyed the home of a friend of his, said, after all, if life is made up totally of houses and furniture and little keepsakes, life is pretty cheap. These things will be lost to me whether I have a fire or not. Ultimately, I will be separated from all of these things by death. Though they are lost now, it is not the most tragic thing that could happen. The most tragic thing in life would be the loss of that which is eternal. I am a soul. That soul was made in the image of God and was made for God, for fellowship with God, for friendship with God. The most tragic thing that can happen is the soul be lost. Said Jesus, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And again he said, man cannot live by bread alone, by material things, by possessions alone. Therefore, in the dictum of John Wesley, do all the good you can by all the means that you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the time you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can, and live your life in the love and the praise and the glory of God, because it isn't your position, but your disposition that will make your life happy and meaningful. Fill your life with love and with faith. Everyone can have faith. If God had said, pay your way into heaven, the poor would be left out. If God had said, work your way into heaven, many of the weak, the blind, the deaf, lame, and sick would be left out. But God says to everyone, simply have faith, believe. And anyone can have faith. Dare to trust God and entrust your life, your death, your eternal life, your eternal future to God and live in the joy of the hereness, the nearness, and the nowness of God. A spiritual renaissance, a vital rediscovery of the simple love of God and of people could utterly transform this world. One may argue that those answers are too simple. 
I replied that any other answers are too complex. The most profound issues of human life are the issues of the human motivation. And until human beings learn how to love, we will fail again and again in the most visionary dreams of peace. For a world at peace without peaceful people is a sheer and total contradiction. The hope of the world is the hope that people can change. And the truth of that is yours to discover, anyone's to discover, by learning that you yourself are capable of change, of beginning to live as you were born and created to live, as you long have longed to live, as a child of eternity, a son or daughter of the everlasting God. This dawning spiritual renaissance is a movement, not an organization. If you live it, you belong to it. If you don't, you don't. It is living by spiritual meanings and values. It is living as an infinitely valuable child of this universe, not as a cosmic orphan, and treating everyone else in precisely that way as well. One of the most simple yet most profound teachings of Jesus is that if you seek, you will find. It is a law of the universe. Your desire is the determining factor. If you yearn and burn to find and know God, surely you shall. But if you feel no need or interest in spiritual things, they will not intrude into your life against your will. The kingdom of God is within you. But whether you will choose to enter into that kingdom of God is quite another matter. And you and only you can settle that. Your will, your decision, your desire, these are the determining factors. One physician who has dedicated his life to working with young drug addicts, Dr. Alan Y. Cohen, recently wrote that people use drugs because they want to and they stop using drugs when they want to. He said it's that simple. Desire, simple desire, is the determining factor. This extends to every element of your human life. If existence is idleness to you, is essentially because that is how you have chosen to make it. Because if you really wanted to live life differently, you could take direct and immediate steps to make changes in your life. Your life can become what you make it, and you can make it what you choose, which brings you to the question, what do you choose? Have you really scrutinized your existence? Have you ever seriously dealt with the possibility there just might be a plan for your life, a purpose, potential for you, which is yours for the choosing? but which you must choose to discover, that you are known to the mind of the infinite God, and within the mind of God there is some best way for you to live, some best part for you to fill, some best work for you to do, some one best exploit for you to undertake or involve yourself in, and that available to you and as near as your next thought, closer than consciousness, is the spiritual presence of the infinite and eternal God whose purposes brought you to being. This adventure is yours for the choosing and the living. If, and only if, it's your decision, if you will to do the will of God, to become one of God's people on this planet by your decision, to become part of a core of spiritually committed individuals who have wholly yielded their lives to their Creator, and who constitute the beginnings of a spiritual renaissance which one day shall win this world to the love of God and the love of people, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man. And it makes no difference what may be your age or profession, whether you're a shoe clerk or a senator, student or professor, employer or employee, young or old. The simple fact is that if you will commit your life utterly and entirely to spiritual purposes and begin to live in the God-guided, dynamically powerful way you were intended to live, your life will become an inexpressible joy, not only here and now, but for all eternity as well. But you need not wait until eternity to discover this. It is yours here and now, if you will have it, if you will choose it, according to your faith, declared the Master, according to your faith, so shall it be to you. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? 
if you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation. Nobody's going to come to your door with an attaché case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644 USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.